I've done over 200 events, given yeah. over $40 million to charity. What's one thing that you took away from the experience working with Nelson Mandela? We're standing there waiting and James Packer comes down with Mandela and he breaks away from James Packer, comes over to Simon, puts his hammer and says, why aren't you at school today? He was a personal person and he cared about people. You were with Bill Clinton on the, on the day of 9-11, he was in Australia for that week. The Secret Service basically closed him down. George W. Bush was president. He signed a special order to send a military jet from Guam to pick President Clinton up because no planes were allowed to fly. I talked to him about your experience working with Kim Kardashian and how professional and impressive she was. Coming close. Getting close. Yeah, don't tell anybody this. After the gig in Chicago, she went out with Kanye West in Chicago that night. Wow. Who was to be her second husband. So all of that started potentially from... It's all my fault. It's all my... You. Blame me. <laughs> all right, we're back again. This episode, far out. I'm, I've been excited for this one. I obviously know who you are and what you've done. We've been, I consider you a friend and a mentor, Max. Thank you. Um, but over the last week when I knew you were coming on, I read your full book again and just reading through some of the stories and what you've done. Honestly, we'd have enough content, enough stories to do a hundred episodes with you, but I'll do my best. We'll try fit in as much as we can to the next hour or so for, for those listening who don't know who Max is, Max is probably Australia's biggest, most well-known, most famous publicist, celebrity manager, events organizer. Thank you. Um, whatever you want to call it. He's also the author of his book and I'll read you the title and it'll give you a bit of context about the life this man's lived. So he goes, uh, on the, on the road with Bill Clinton, Nelson Mandela, Kim Kardashian, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Tony Blair, Al Gore, Mike Tyson, Pele and more. Just in that <laughs> is like, fuck, you've lived an extraordinary life. And Max, where I want to start with you is just how you got here. How did some humble man from Bournemouth in the UK end up working with and building relationships with literally the biggest celebrities on the planet. And you can answer that in whichever way you want to get there, but I'm just so fascinated by where you were and the life and the career you've been able to build. I'm blessed for starters. Yeah. I'm genuinely blessed. I'm appreciative of, of that. But I started, my, my dad was a high diver. Yeah. He, you know, when yeah. <laughs> dives off the diving boards in the swimming pool. And he had an aqua show, which is like mm -hmm. an ice show, but in water with synchronized swimmers. Yeah. And so I grew up around that, that in Bournemouth on the south coast of England. Yeah. And so I'd go build posting with him, putting posters up. Yeah. And I'd, st I'd be on the spotlight when I was like five <laughs> or six or seven. And I'd fall asleep on the spotlight. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'd do front of house. So yeah. I'd put a, you know, when I was 10 or 12, you know, hi, welcome. You know, which, let me show you your tickets. Yeah. All this sort of stuff. So that's how I started. And then uh, my dad died when I was 15, oh, wow. and that definitely changed my life. I, I, uh, I always felt that that was the worst thing that could happen to me. And, and so I always pushed things to the edge after that. Mm. And, and because I thought, well, what's the worst that can happen? And I've had the worst that can yeah. happen at 15. Anyway, I, I, I left, I was at boarding school, and I came home to live with my mum. And I got a job. I went to school still because I had to do my A-levels, which I failed. <laughs> but I, uh, I got a job at 50 pence a night as a spotlight operator yeah. at the local nightclub. And because I had experience as a spotlight operator when I was a kid. And uh, I started doing the spotlight. And I'd cycle down there at 10 o'clock at night. Mm. I'd put the, you know, when you're on a bicycle, you'd have to put your socks over your <laughs> long trousers. So they didn't get, didn't get mucky. Caught. Yeah. Anyway, from there, the club closed down. And I was doing my exams and I finished up deciding I'd promote BBC Radio 1 disc jockeys in the nightclub. Mm. I failed my exams because I was over the road. Well, in the, during the exam time when you're supposed to be studying, I'd be going over the road and using the phone box. There was no mobile phones in those days. And I'd be putting money in and ringing agents to book the BBC Radio 1 DJs. Had a great summer. Yeah. In, uh, this is 1974, so I'd just turned 18. And uh, made money, lost it all in the winter, did it again. <laughs> uh, never finished up finishing my A levels, and I was going to become a chartered accountant. That never happened. And then when I was 21, uh, I'd, by that time I was promoting pop groups and BBC Radio One disc jockeys all over England. And I came here for a holiday, wow. and I stayed. And I haven't been well, I've been back obviously, but yeah. I, I live in Australia, so I've been here 45 years now. What do you think about the whole you know pub like? event management, putting people on, putting on these massive shows. What do you think drew you to that? I'd, I, I'd, I'd started doing events. Uh, I was involved with Variety, the children's charity, and uh, I'd, I'd started helping them do events. And then we had some big names came over who did charity stuff for Variety. Mm. Sammy Davis Jr. was a superstar as, you know, if you know Frank Sinatra and Liza Minnelli, Sammy Davis Jr. and like is in all the old movies and stuff. Yeah. So as a result of that, I then started uh, 
one day a guy called John Singleton, who uh, is a famous advertising guy and used to own the radio networks and stuff like that. Anyway, he is still alive and he's 81. Anyway, he rang me up and wanted me to ro- do his birthday roast. Yeah. I did that. <laughs> and then one day he rings me up and says, come down to the Park Height. And I get to the Park Height and he's there with the then sports, federal sports minister, Graham Richardson, and an old rugby league footballer from St. George called Johnny Raper, who's one of the wow. immortals of rugby league. Died, unfortunately, last year. Anyway, he said, look... <laughs> Johnny Raper didn't earn any money in the 50s and 60s. Yeah. Can you organize one of those functions like you did when you roasted me for variety and gave variety $200,000? I said, no, I don't want to know about that. I was happy to do it for, vo- for yeah. variety and for charity and voluntarily. He said, we'll pay you like we pay you to do work for KFC and tours. By this time, I had my PR company going. So I said, oh, all right. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So I did this function and we had uh, the auctioneer was Ray Hadley. The person who did the tribute was Alan Jones. Uh, famous old rock and roller called Cole Joy sang the national anthem. Des Renford, who, was a, who uh, did the grace before the meal, and Des Renford, for those who don't know, uh, was a cross-channel swimmer. He swam the English Channel 19 times wow. before he found out there was a ferry. <laughs> and so we gave Johnny Raper $70,000 from this luncheon. So Singo says, let's do one of these every year for an old sports, old rugby league player. So yeah. we'll do it for an old sports star because we can honor Dawn Fraser. Dawn Fraser's triple Olympic gold medalist and yeah. she didn't earn any money in the 50s and 60s. So we honored Dawn and we gave Dawn $240,000. Next year we honored Betty Cuthbert, who also is a famous old Olympian. She got $260,000. Next year we did it for Raylene Boyle, who had breast cancer and she was a famous Olympian. She got $380,000. I'm just doing this one luncheon each year. And then we honored Reg Gasney, who was a former St. George player. Yeah. He'd had a stroke. He got $410,000. And then after that, people just started, can you do a function for us? So uh, I started doing functions. And so that, so my main business is publicity. I still do that today. That's yeah. my main business. And then uh, I started doing events. And then I started managing people as well. Yeah. And that's what I do all day long. I just sit around. <laughs> Yeah, because that's that's a question I have. It's like, yeah, everyone here's he's a he's a celebrity publicist. What what does that mean? What do you do on a day to day? So the events thing I understand, but apart from that, what does a publicist do? What does a PR manager for celebrities and influencers do? I, I get them exposure in the media on TV, press, radio, magazines. So uh, I, I I write a news release, send it out to the media, and I hustle. I get on the phone and yeah. set up interviews. So I've got, so what do I mean today? I've had, I've got the, I'm doing publicity for the visits of million dollar listing LA's Josh Altman, yeah. Josh Flagg and Matt Altman. And we're doing events in Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane. And I'm doing the publicity for it. Mm. So this weekend I've got Josh Flagg doing an hour of interviews out of Los Angeles. So I've started hustling and setting up the <laughs> schedule. And that's what I do. I, 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 I promote products, I promote individuals, and I charge them money. Because, um, because right now you're Max Marx and you've been in the industry for decades. I'm sure it doesn't take as long as it used to. If you want to get on the phone, you have everyone's contact number. Everyone knows who you are. But talk to me about the early days of your business when you were sitting in your friend's grey maps boardroom with your pe- sheet of paper and pencils and you're like, okay, we're at the start. I've got to build this thing. Take me back to those days. What was it like working from there? Look, when I started, uh, I my first client, <laughs> I'd been sacked from 2WS. I was their <laughs> yeah. promotions manager. And a <laughs> mate of mine rang me up, Leon Naxon, who's still around today, he owns Hay House Books in this country. And he said, I've got a client for you. His name's David Bannerman, who's a lawyer in Blacktown. And he can pay you $50 a week. I said, like, fine, what is he going to do? And he's promoting this system where you can uh, – dial a fruit basket. So you dial and, mm. so, and the, somebody will deliver a basket of fruit for you. So when I was at WS, there's this gorgeous girl called Sally Mepham from Toon Gabby. And she uh, had, uh, this is so politically incorrect, but large breasts. Yes. Yeah. Right. And so uh, I got her and we did a picture of her with uh, a basket of fruit, obviously a couple of melons at the front, <laughs> et cetera. And, uh, and so I got a picture, I got the picture in the yeah. Paramount of Mercury and the Daily Telegraph and, yeah. and people would ring up and order their fruit. And then I went from there with other companies. There's a friend of mine from the radio station introduced me to who's, um, was in Rupert Murdoch on Channel 10 yeah, at, the moment, yeah. at the time. Anyway, I finished up, they had a show called The Reporters and they got me to do some publicity for them. 
spent five grand a month for that. So that was good. Yeah. And then there was another, the Socceroos was starting then and then somebody had the licensing. So I suddenly had a few clients and there was, a, I never knew this at the time, but Kerry Stokes, who now owns Channel 7, but at the time he owned a company called PGF, which is a golf company. Yeah. And they were launching a yellow ball. So I said, okay, let's do a, uh, a, a tea party, T double E party, <laughs> and we'll do a hole in one contest. And I rang up a few celebrities, had Kamal and Ginny Little and various people. Just, I said, Come down, I'm doing this event. Yeah. And I think they all felt sorry for me because I've been sacked from the radio station. I had to start my business up. Get, get the early business in for sympathy, doesn't and, matter. And, uh, and, I, and I got publicity. Mm. And, and, and I've always been able to generate publicity. I just see an angle for the story. Mm. Uh, and my best press here, this is one, my best press release I've ever written. I was, uh, this is going back 30 years. I haven't done a better one since. But, anyway, <laughs> but I was managing Jane Fleming and Duncan Armstrong. Yeah. And they were athletes. And I was running a PR school. The one of it where like people would pay a grand. Yeah. I'd do a, one lesson a week for an hour and people come along. Anyway, so Marcus Blackmore, who owned Blackmore's, rings up, said, come and see me. I'll buy some tickets for your PR school. But <laughs> yeah. I really want to talk to you about Jane Fleming and Duncan Armstrong. And so he signed both of them up for Blackmore's. And Jane had to promote a product called Ginsana, which is a ginseng root extract, mm -hmm. which pecked you up later in the day. And uh, Duncan was signed to Vitablow, which was a vitamin company. So I did this release. Jane Fleming and Duncan Armstrong visit Sydney for a route. <laughs> and the first paragraph <laughs> said, Jane Fleming and Duncan Armstrong visit Sydney uh, to go to their healthy life show yeah. to promote Ginsano, which is a root extract of ginseng or whatever. <laughs> so, uh, so I got the, there was a, the midday show, mm. rang, said, oh, can we have Jane and Duncan on the show? Yes, get them on. They talked about the product. Within 72 hours, you could not buy this product. It was sold out really, in the whole country. Yeah. And the deal I'd done for Jane, who funnily enough earlier today just pumped, bumped into her. I hadn't seen wow. her for a little while. And, uh, but the deal I did for Jane was $40,000 guarantee a year for two years, plus 10% of whatever the increase in the sales were. And at the time, they'd done a quarter of a million dollars worth of sales. So 250 grand worth of sales. At the end of that first year, they did 1.25 million. So Jane, wow. in addition to 40 grand, got another $100,000 bonus. And the following year, it increased again. So I just see the angle for stuff mm. and then make it happen. One thing you said that <clears throat> I find very interesting you said we talk about the uh, the the melons and the, and the yep. fruit. It's very politically incorrect. Now, being in PR for as long as you have, things have changed, and what you could say completely acceptably twenty, thirty years ago, even ten years ago, changes. How have you navigated that and used that to your advantage? Because I know a lot of the people you work with. Sometimes you like to walk that fine line to you know get the most press and buzz as you can. Have you? Is it something you've consciously had to be aware of and like maybe 10 years ago I'd do that and now maybe not? Or you're like, fuck it, I'm just going to stay true and have a bit of fun with it. I, I definitely am aware of the changing rules of life yeah, that we all yeah. have to face now. But I, I, I try not to be dragged down to it. I'm definitely yeah. anti-woke, right? Yeah. I mean, and I have this discussion yeah. regularly with friends and people. and, and But for me, I just want to keep moving forward, yeah. keep pushing forward yeah. all the time, whether it's business, whether it's life. I just enjoy my life tremendously mm -hmm. and I love my work. And if we have to be acknowledged, it'd be an understanding of that, we do. But yeah. but but I love stirring the pot. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm doing a thing at the moment. I've got a client, um, Jimmy Sirve, who's got a company uh, and he's number of brands. We do publicity for all of them. Celebrity Slim, Hair Care Bear, uh, Ice Away. And he's got one brand called Life Botanics. Mm -hmm. And we've gone up oh, against I'm, Vitamin Wars, I call yeah, it, right? Yeah, I love this. And there's a, a very successful woman called Jessica Siepel who's got a brand called JS Health. She's got about 400,000 followers on her Instagram. And the business is worth five or $600 million. Like, she's done super well wow. uh, with her brand. Anyway, Jim has uh, created this brand, Life Botanics. And... It's exactly the same ingredients, gone to the TJ, exactly the same ingredients as Jessica Siepel has on. And he launched early March with a, a, on his Instagram, on Life Botanics Instagram, saying, if you like JS Health, you'll like Life Botanics. And it's half the price, same ingredients, mm -hmm. it's available at Coles. Because he, was, he felt she's just put a brand tax on, she's just charging too much. Anyway, so the day she, he announced that, Jessica Siepel went and wrote on her Instagram, not one story, not two stories. She ran 46 stories to her 400,000 followers complaining about Life Botanics. 
because they did enormous sales over the weekend. Of course, I imagine. So then, because he he, he unfortunately lost his uh, first wife to cancer, he decided to donate twenty thousand dollars to breast cancer. So he put that up there. So she went and wrote on Life Botanics feed, "This is a false. This is a fake donation." So he got the. So he then reposted with the receipt as well as the donation. So. Then on the Monday, they'd done a load of sales, which is great. I placed a story with the Daily Mail. Mm. You know, I did a little release, Vitamin Wars, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. day four or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and we finished up with about 10 stories from the Daily Mail online because she got she got upset, so we just run more stories. Yeah. And then Channel 7 online ran it, and then the uh, news.com like, just kept running and running. Mm. And, and to this day, we're still running it. You know, so that's... You know, I, just getting my hands dirty a bit, but you know, well, I'm, I'm blocked by Jessica Siepel. I'm sure. And I'm sure if she sees this, she'd definitely switch it off. She wouldn't <laughs> want to know. That's the thing. There's a lot of um, opportunity and controversy. And that's something that we've, of, of course, it makes so much sense. You've made a whole living and business off, off that. But what we've noticed is a lot of our, you know, I said we, we clip up like maybe 10 clips per episode and we yeah. put like the best clips onto Instagram and TikTok. We've noticed there might be some really great educational or motivational pieces of TikTok and they will go viral to a certain extent, but the clips that launch and get like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of views and like thousands of saves and comments is anything controversial where there can be a take on either side because it just sparks that conversation and there's going to be people so passionate on this side and so passionate on that side and then they just argue in the comments and it just blows up and Absolutely. shows that to so many more people. You can't be blancmange nowadays. No. You have to you can't be wallpaper. You have to be loved or hated uh, and or, that, and, or entertained. You've got to be entertaining. That's exactly the thing I was talking to Joe just before you arrived. <clears throat> it's like in today's society you, it's it's a fine line between like you don't want you, the whole woke cancel culture thing, you know what I mean? Like I may agree with some, like a lot of the things, but I fucking hate woke culture, cancel culture. People should be able to express themselves and their opinions regardless if you agree with them. You might completely disagree with me on something, but that's your right. I feel like we should be able to have a conversation about that. So it's like, I think now in terms of having a personal brand and the people that are doing really well off the bat are the ones that are just completely what, like on one side of the, uh, on one side of the argument and they're blowing up, but it's like, you can do that and you can lean only into controversy, but there's going to be real work, like life consequences. The big brands aren't going to want to partner with people that stand for sure. that. So it's like, what's you, where do you kind of recommend playing in that? Obviously you'd work with people that do, that do everything. Right. But how do you navigate wanting to be able to stand for something and lean into the controversy, but the cancel culture is a real thing. Right. Yeah, well, you've got to be careful. If you've got a, mm. if you've got a multi-billion dollar brand, mm. you play it straight because yeah. you don't want to screw up that. But if you're having fun, you have the fun. Yeah. And and, and like, But I, I don't know how much you know about Thomas the Tank Engine. Right? I remember a little bit from my childhood. Well, Thomas the Tank Engine is really popular for kids. Yeah. And now they say the cancel culture said the fat controller can no longer be called the fat controller. Oh. He has to be called Sir Topham or whatever That's his name. So I mean, you can't dumb. do that to kids. Oh. Like, it's just crazy. Yeah. But they do. And, the and, and I, I, that, it goes all the way through. I mean, you know, they start with the kids. <laughs> Let's move through the it's wrong, but it is. But this is life, mm. and hopefully it'll swing back the other way eventually. Yeah. Well, mm. that's the thing. It'll overcorrect and then hopefully correct again. Um, I want to ask you about some some stories from some of these massive tours you went on. But before that, for anyone who's watching it on YouTube, it's speaking of fucking cancel culture, we just had a YouTube account taken down for weeks because of breaching community guidelines. It turns out it was just some glitch. But you're like, you never know. You say one thing someone doesn't agree with, and they'll try to take you down. The one thing I want to ask you about is. Early on in your career, you were the assistant media director for the 2000 Olympics. I was. Tell me a little bit about that. That sounds like a lot of fun. I had the time of life. I lived yeah. in, a, in a container for a month. <laughs> yeah. right? Literally You're in the, probably in the village with all the athletes and everything. So, right? Yeah, I was all the had your uniform and everything. And everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my jacksuit. And uh, during the month or so before, obviously, as the as the Australian teams were coming in from yeah. overseas and competing there, so I was helping with the official ceremonies and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, and at one stage, I was, I was actually – He's on the Australian Olympic Committee in the meeting. Oh, wow. I think Singo couldn't go. And then he replaced, he, he got Alex Hamill to step in. And, and I was the assistant media director. <laughs> so I was there. But I had the best time. Yeah. I, I really did. I had to resign. I was managing a number of athletes at the time. Mm. Um, and my athletes finished up doing really, doing really well in the Olympics because I think we won uh, a 
Michael Diamond won a gold medal. Matt Ryan won a gold medal. So I've got two gold medals. I hope I'm not forgetting somebody. Uh, yeah. Matt Welsh won a bronze and a silver. Yeah. Uh, and I was managing Yana Pittman at the time, who mm. went on to great – that was her first Olympics. I had the best I, – I, I'd, I'd spend – I had – I'd spend every day looking after me, obviously. Yeah. But what would happen – I'd kick off in the morning as soon as I woke up. Uh, I'd have – my own little studio there. So we do a live cross to what's now Sunrise. Uh, I'd find an athlete who'd done something special the day yeah. before and we'd have them there. And then I'd do a couple of radio interviews. These were the official partners of the yeah. Olympics. Then I'd take whoever the athlete is outside the village for the non-accredited uh, yeah. media. And we'd have, then the accredited media was seven. So then we'd have nine outside. So we'd have the t live cross to today show, pre-record for Kona Fair with Mike Munro. And then uh, I'd have to take the athlete in to do a media conference in the village. Then we'd have to go and uh, have breakfast. And, and I'd normally pal up with a guy called Laurie Lawrence, who's yeah. a famous swim coach. And so you'd have breakfast in the, with whoever you wanted to have breakfast with. And then we'd say, okay, what's on today? Where should we go? And I had a, there was a media, for each sport, we had a media liaison officer yeah. and then because I was the assistant media director I could go wherever I wanted yeah. so I'd normally go and see what's going on yeah, yeah. and and then I'd go and help them and that uh, first night the swimming was on and I distinctly remember you know, helping Ian Hansen who was looking after the swimming and we had to bring back um, the, the we'd won I don't know if it's the 4 by 100 people like Michael yeah. Clem and stuff like that anyway at the end I've got Ian Thorpe there because he'd had to they had to massage him down. He had another swim the next day. And I've got in thought, and I've got to get, back, get him back to the village. And there's no buses anymore because it's the first night of the games. And yeah. they, they, so I'm making phone calls. I got a bus came over and the, got him back there. Then I went and had a uh, meal with Michael Klim and some of the athletes. It was just the best time. And, and that was, but that was every single day. And I was going wherever gold medalists were. And I, then I remember being with Michael Diamond, and he was on the two days. And he said his hero was Peter Brock. And oh, Peter yeah. Brock was one of our athlete liaison officers. So Michael was leading going into the second day. So I went and said to Brocky, come and you know, come and have lunch with Michael Diamond. He's got to go for gold this afternoon because yeah. on the Sunday. And uh, so Michael was just blown away when you know his hero comes in. And so they had lunch, obviously. And then he went out. He won gold. And then I'm there with his mum and this other guy standing next to me. And Michael's won gold and he walks over to see his mum, obviously, gives his mum, and I'm going <laughs> like this. To the other guy. Mum's there, I said, Michael, oh, hello, Prime Minister, how are you? Like he didn't, he was just in a zone, oh, won gold, yeah. he's with his mum. Anyway, then we, uh, then I have to get him, they have to be drug tested straight away. So I've taken him to get him drug tested straight away, then does the accredited media, then we've got to, he's got to be on Channel 7, take him back there. And he's brought his mum with everywhere, which is fine. Then we've got to get his mum into the village. Uh, that really needs a little bit more time. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm on the phone to Graham Richardson, who's the mayor of the village, and saying, look, Michael Dimes wants to win gold, wants to be his mum. So his mum comes in. His mum's all over Mark Philippoussis, loves Mark <laughs> Philippoussis because she's Greek. <laughs> He's Greek. So it was just – and and those are was happening every day for me, just with all these superstars. It was, I had the best time. There was a buzz around the whole city, I imagine, at that point, right? It was enormous. And what about – I was reading in your book, you were working on – you were like mid – one of your big tours and you had to do some... I had Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela. And so I had to get permission from uh, John Coates, the head of the Australian Olympic Committee and team and everything, to leave the village uh, to go and look after Nelson Mandela, as you do. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I had three functions within two days with Mandela. So I had a luncheon, which we charged... James Packer hosted it, and we sold 20 tickets at $25,000 a head. This is on Monday the 4th of September. So this is – I'm in the village already, but this is before the games had started. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we sold – and I, I sat down with James and said, this is the people I think we should invite, and he'd take some off, put some on, and then I'd uh, send out the invitations, and then if they'd say no, I'd tell his office, and within half an hour they'd <laughs> ring back and say yes because James Backer. Who's going to say no? So I did that, and then I did another function on the night for charity for Lion Nathan Foundation, put 200 grand in, and we gave money – we raised money all night with an auction and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, Mandela was seriously impressive, mm. seriously impressive. And then the next day we did another function where he just wanted to speak to the Jewish community. I'm Jewish, so I've got all the rabbis and leaders yeah. of the charities. And for an hour they had a stand-up argument. Mandela was very passionate about Palestine and he was complaining about how the Israelis and is treating the Palestinians. Yeah. So uh, they had a literally stand-up argument for an hour. What were you thinking? 
I don't. I just do it. I just treat everybody as they are yeah, and I just yeah. go through them, you know, make sure the function works. That's yeah. all I care about. So, uh, and what's obviously one of the most important people of the last century, Man Nelson Mandela, what's one thing that you took away from the experience um, working with him? You said he's a very impressive individual, but what stood out as like a, a quality that he had? I think before the luncheon started, I th had this guy um, named Simon Cohen, who's a, on what's the uh, TV show that's on Amazon, the oh, real estate show. Lux, Lux listings. listings, yeah, yeah. Is that the, yeah, with Gavin yeah. Rubenstein? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so Simon's on that. He's the buyer's agent. Yeah. So he's rung me up uh, saying, oh, you know, my dad from the local synagogue or whatever. Uh, I said, yeah, can I come and do work experience with you? I said, yeah, but it's, you know, it's the week of the Monday, the 4th of September. Yeah. I said, make sure you wear a suit. You never know who you're going to meet. Yeah, yeah. Right? And so on that Monday morning he started. So I brought him down for the private lunch. And uh, we're standing there waiting. And James Packer comes down with Mandela. We've only got 20 people in the thing. And he sees... Uh, Simon, and he breaks away from James Backer, comes over to Simon, puts his hand on and says, why aren't you at school today? <laughs> <laughs> but just, he was a personal person, and he cared about people. Yeah. And he, when he stood up on stage, um, we'd had the national anthem, the Qantas Girls Choir sing, and he's sitting at his table, and I've got Bob Hawke there, Gough Whitlam, Premier, like, you know, Malcolm Fraser, like serious people there. Uh, obviously, I'm not serious, right? But <laughs> but they are serious and, by association. Yeah, and so they'd sung when they finished singing the national anthem. He stood up, he walked over from his table or across the dance floor or whatever to shake every one of those kids' hands. Wow. There's like 30 kids there, so thank you very much, thank you. And then when he did his speech on stage, he says, "Normally, I only speak for 10, 15 minutes, but you are so important. I will speak longer tonight." Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was just nice. Yeah, and he was a personable person cared about you know there's little things and yeah. and and from that it makes me think about president clinton because they've both got the same sort of uh caring if that makes yeah. sense i had pre i've toured president clinton four times and uh i get on well with him we spend time together because if you've got someone on the road for a week they might be doing five events of yeah. two hours each yeah. but you've got the other 158 hours you've got to look after them sort of thing yeah and in 2006 we did this event in, we'd done, we were doing Sydney, Melbourne, and Auckland. And in Melbourne, he's on stage, there were a thousand people there. And we're doing the Q&A part of it. And somebody asked a question, you know, oh, everyone knows you've got great people handling skills, but what, what's the secret of your success? And, and his people handling skills really are probably the secret. And he simplifies stuff for people. Yeah. So he's got a really complex problem. He'll simplify it so you can understand yeah. it. Anyway, he explained in answer to that question, he said, we often... When we come to work in the morning, we'll just walk past the receptionist. My name is Mike Hi, but we just go yeah. straight to work. We get our head in our phone and we're just doing our stuff. So there's a place in Africa where if you walk down the street, you see someone, you stop, you look them up and down, I see you. And so you actually acknowledge that person. And anyway, we'd, we'd left after he'd finished. I'd take him out with his secret service, people around him. we get in a lift, we go down, and I'd put him into the... Uh, to put him into his motorcade. And as he leaves, there's a lift operator. As he leaves the, the lift, op as he l walks out the lift, the lift, he touches the lift operator on the arm. He goes, out. I took him out. He's gone. I've got to go up because I've got other speakers on. And I get in. I'm with the lift operator. And uh, I tell him the story I just told you. And I said, did you notice that President Clinton touched your arm? He says, you know what? It made my day that President Clinton touched my arm. Yeah. I've been here six, six o'clock this morning. In fact, the President Clinton actually acknowledged me. Yeah. And I think we need to do that. We need to acknowledge people whether it's receptionist, whether it's a PA, whether it's anybody, just just to stop, slow down just a little bit and acknowledge the people you work with, the people you friend. Because yeah. they might be your workers, but they're your friends as well. You, you're working with them for years on end. Yeah, You just need to acknowledge people. Now, on, on former President Bill Clinton, you've been lucky enough to work with and develop relationships with loads of people, but arguably your most special or closest connection was with um, Bill Clinton. What's it like for you, as we said, that guy from Bournemouth in the UK, fast forward a little bit of time and he's singing karaoke at 3am in the morning with the former president of the United States. It's just cool. And, yeah. I, and I live for the moment. I always live for the moment. Yeah. I, I never stop and think, well, I've come from, you know, yeah. it's, good, it's, it's okay to look back, don't stare. So yeah. I'm very much in the moment. I, mean, I'm, I always try and be really professional with the people mm -hmm. I meet and just to look after them and make sure they're happy with yeah. what's going on because... 
you know, they've come halfway around the world. I might be paying them money, and but I've got to look after them. I want yeah. to make sure that they walk away from it, the experience, and they've enjoyed it. And I, uh, it's just really cool. But I, I, I did publicity for a woman who you won't have heard of, but when I explain who she is, you will understand. Her name's Valerie Jarrett, and she worked in the White House as a special assistant to Barack Obama from the day he went in to the day he left. Black American woman who, uh, in Chicago, first employed, uh, she was working in the mayor's office then, Michelle Obama came in, she wasn't married then, came in for a job. Valerie wanted to employ her, and she said, I'll have to talk to my fiancé. Next thing, Barack Obama's on the phone. Just He was a worker in the local community, <laughs> and they finished up becoming friends, Michelle, Barack, and Valerie, and she went with him the whole way. Anyway, she came over to do some speaking engagements, and I reached out uh, in advance to see if she could do some media because I'm doing the publicity. And we set the media up, and uh, I never spoke to her. I was dealing with her, her, her people. And then I sent a note back after the done. I sent the clips and all that, and I said, please thank Valerie very much for me for doing the media interviews. And a note came back from Valerie to me saying, pleasure, really thank you for doing that. And you know what? I was with my friend Arnold Schwarzenegger the other day. He said you'd look after me really well <laughs> in Australia. So that's a, that's a, that's a wrap. Yeah. You know? One question I, I knew I wanted to ask you when when we um, got you coming in is, obviously you, you, you're you're making a lot of money that, for these people, so there's that element, but also you've developed relationships or connections, whether they be longer term or whether they're just for the week or two weeks you're with them. My question is, some of these people that you're working with and spending time with are the most influential and powerful people on the planet. For you, what do you think the secret is to getting people to like you? Because in your business and everyone's business, getting people to like you is so important. What do you think about what you've done has been able to, you know, let you build these connections with these, you know, incredibly powerful people? I think it, it doesn't have to be powerful to anybody. I, I'm like, I think of myself sometimes, I'm a bit like a chameleon. So I become reflective of the person I'm with. So I try and fit into them. So every time I get in a taxi or an Uber, well, maybe not every time, but <laughs> yeah. often I'm on the phone. But often I'll, I'll get in and I'll ask them about themselves. So yeah. I said, hey, where Because sometimes they're from another country or they've yeah. got a different accent. I said, where are you from? How do you And Because everybody's got a story. Mm. And it's really interesting to listen to their story. So I, I enjoy that. I, enjoy pe I genuinely enjoy people. And I think that makes it easy for me. And whether it's President Clinton, Nelson Mandela, Arnold Schwarzenegger, I just try and fit into their yeah. whatever they want. But at the same time, at the same time, something you mentioned in your book was obviously you're, you're your own unique character in and of yourself, right? What's the importance of being able to be authentic and, and being your true self as well? How important is that? Um, don't try, just do it. Yeah. Just be yourself, have fun. I mean, for me, I always say have fun because I yeah. enjoy having fun. And I like singing. We haven't sung yet. Yeah. <laughs> Here <laughs> we, we go. We'll get we, ready for that one. We can sing. No, I do. I always enjoy singing. Yeah. You know? And... And I think you just got to be yourself. That, yeah. That's the, that, at the end of the day, that and that is authentic. Yeah. You know? yeah. And if you're a shit, the people like <laughs> people are going to see through much. your bullshit anyway, right? I think so. Mm. Um, one of the questions I, I wanted to ask you about your time with uh, Bill Clinton was obviously you had a lot of fun trips, um, and you you brought him out multiple times, but you were you were with Bill Clinton on the on the day of nine eleven. He was in Australia for that week. Yes. Talk to me about the chaos would have been like that happened on this side of the planet when that, when you got that call, like what's going through everyone's mind. I was, I was young, but I remember watching it on TV. I was like a probably eight year old boy. I realized. Dylan, that, you're still young. That's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> look, you've got hair. I've got none I left. Well, right. look, we're, we're getting, starting to go gray, Max. All the stress <laughs> of a business is getting to me. But even, even as an eight year old, I knew somehow, and maybe it was my parents energy watching it on, on later night of TV that, whoa, this is something really important. What was it like for you getting that phone call and then I believe that the Air Force flew in and picked him up or, or something? like? Look, what happened, he'd arrived on the Saturday the 8th of September yeah. and uh, we'd done a function that night where it cleared $1.2 million profit for the Children's Hospital at Westmead. Then we did another function on the Sunday. We played golf on the Sunday uh, and did another function that night where I sold 40 tickets at $50,000 a head. Then we did flew to Melbourne for do another function there where 30 tickets at $20,000 a head, and that was the 10th. And he flew up to uh, Port Douglas, 
And then the Tuesday, which was 9-11, I'm having dinner at home and that's when the, the planes hit. And so my phone blows up. <laughs> I'm getting the phone. Yeah. Anyway, in Port Douglas, what happened, the Secret Service basically closed him down, shipped him wherever it was, down to yeah. Cairns. President George Bush, George W. Bush was president. He signed a special order to send a military jet from Guam to pick President Clinton up because no planes were allowed to fly. Uh, they took him back to, he, he was supposed to do some more dates in Asia, they took him back to uh, New York. Um, and that was it. And about three years later, I'm doing a function, I'm in New York, and I'm going to a function where he's speaking at it, and I bumped him outside beforehand. And this would be, I can't remember, whatever, whatever, but I remember distinctly, and I'd taken like 30 people over this function. It was a big function at Radio City Music Hall with like, 5,000 people there, and I've got some guests, and I'm sitting in the front row because I've spoken to the organiser and I'd help them sell some tickets and stuff. And uh, anyway, Clinton's on stage, and a question or something came up about 9-11, and uh, in front of these 7,000 people, oh, 9-11, I was in Australia with this man, Max Markson. <laughs> <laughs> so it's 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 obviously a, a day we all remember. Yeah. But it was, yeah, and, and immediately his staff said, oh, you just got a name check, now I've got a motion on my Blackberry or whatever it yeah. was at the time. But just, I brought him back. Actually, I had George Bush Sr. come back and speak to me two months later. Yeah. So I had to brief him on what to speak about. And I, and I said, you know, what do you advise to your son? Yeah. And he, he spoke. And he told a couple of funny stories at the end as well. This is George Bush Sr. He does, uh, he, he says, you know, during the summer just gone, uh, I'm sitting at home, you know, in my bed with with Barbara. That's him, yeah. and and George W comes in and I'm sitting there reading the paper with his feet up. <laughs> Barbara says, "George W, take your feet off the table." I said, "Barbara, he's the president of the United States of America. <laughs> I don't care. George W, take your feet off the table." Yeah. And then the other one he said was that um, there was a time when he was president, and his son George W, and his other son Jed both became governors of Florida and uh, uh, Texas, Texas, whatever, right. at the same time, the same day. So he uh, chartered a plane so he could be in, congratulate them both on the night. Anyway, some journalist says to me, how do you, some journalist says to him, he's telling the story, says, says to me, how do you feel about, you know, both your sons becoming, oh, this is the happiest day of my life. And Barb was with him and says, what about the day we got married? Yeah. <laughs> but but it, it's just a, it was a weird time then yeah. for the world. And, and then I brought President Clinton came back Four months later, and we did five events in eight days all around the country. Yeah. We did Perth, Adelaide, Melbourne, Brisbane, Sydney. So just, yeah, weird times. Because you also spent some time with Rudy Giuliani, who was the, 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 was the mayor of New York at the yeah. time, or governor of New York, whatever it was. Oh, no, he was the, he was the mayor of the city. The mayor of the city. And, and as President Clinton's people said to me, uh, said, look, before 9-11 happened, Rudy Giuliani had been kicked out of Gracie <laughs> Mansion because he fell out with his wife. Uh, he didn't have a book deal. He didn't yeah. have a job to go to. 9-11, really Giuliani just, you know, yeah. he was the world's mayor uh, and was really held that city together and inspired America and, mm. and the world. And I uh, finished up, I, I, I reached out to him after done these events with President Clinton in 2001, 2002. I reached, and George Bush Sr., I reached out to try and get him to come over. And his eight, and I offered a chunk of money. His agent said, "No, no, no, no. We're, we're too busy here in America." Yeah. And then I finished up able to get him. It took me a year to get him, but we brought him over, and uh, I'm still friends with him. I get well with him. Yeah. He was great. Something that uh, I found interesting about um, Clinton was that he has a, a what do you call him an advance man, who would you'd send over to meet you and uh, literally walk every step that the, the the president would then walk, right? More than one advance man. So when we we're doing the five events in eight cities. Uh, I had advanced people in every single city and secret service notes. So I had 60 secret service agents in there. Yeah. So, and they literally do walk every single step. So, so that when he comes, they know exactly what's going on. And they have secret service agents based at the hospital, God forbid something goes wrong there, the hotel where he's staying, the venue, whatever, whatever's going on. And they need to be experts. You know, we're going to visit the children's hospital. So I had someone there. Yeah. It's very much... Um, you know, they'd take all the precautions. So that taught me a lot. Yeah. And the size of the, the entourage when you're traveling with uh, a, an ex-president of the United States versus the size of the entourage that travels with you. You and me when we're walking, walking around the streets. Along, 
or potentially Kim Kardashian, whose entourage is bigger? Oh, Clinton, President Clinton, because we've got Secret Service, yeah. whole team of them. Yeah. I mean, the, the the first time I bought President Clinton, I was no, I had no knowledge of this at you all. Know, yeah. And about two weeks before, I get a call from the federal attorney general's office in Canberra saying, uh, can we have a meeting with you? I said, sure, what about? I said, yeah. you've got President Clinton coming in two weeks' time. We need to you know, work through protocols and stuff. I said, yeah. sure. Yeah. Should we, should we, where do you want to meet? Should we meet at the hotel we're doing that? So we met at the Stanford in Double Bay, yeah. which is now the Intercontinental Hotel. Right? And uh, and I'm pretty often late to my meetings, unfortunately. And I get there 10 minutes late, and there's like 20 people in the room. I said, what yeah. are you all doing here? So, well, I'm from the attorney general's office, and this is my yeah. assistant. I said, yeah. I said, I'm with the... Uh, Australian Federal Police uh, will be uh, with you on the roads, yeah. And uh, <laughs> and I'm with the Rose Bay Police Station. That's the local police station. Yeah. Fine. And I'm with the terrorist squad. Terrorist squad. Yeah. Excuse me. That's all right. uh, I'm with the you know we do the threat assessments, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everything, yeah. uh, and and this one. I'm with the motorcade. Motorcade, yeah, everywhere you go, Mr. Marks, you have a motorcade. <laughs> now, I only want to travel everywhere with a yeah. motorcade, obviously. And then, and what about these guys? These guys with dark glasses and things in their ear. So, one, two, three, four, five. We're the Secret Service advance team. So, okay, fine. Yeah. So, so, and then they just want to, well, what's going to happen? What do you mean, what's going to happen? Well, what are you doing? Where are you going? What, so, okay, well, we'll start at the airport when they arrive. And, yeah. and they're all excited. Everyone's making notes of this. <laughs> yeah. And I think, well, I'm dictating to 25 really important people. Um, then we'll come to the hotel. Uh, and I suppose uh, we'll probably, gonna, well, we're we'll going to the children's hospital if he wants to go there. Yeah. And then we're doing the function that night. Where's the function? It's a da -da -da -da. So, so they're working all this out now. They've got to start planning all the routes and everywhere yeah. they're going. And... They're really good because it said, so don't worry about us. We'll, you do whatever you want to do. We'll make it all work for so you. So you don't have to pay for all that sort of stuff that comes nah, with them? No, nah. freebies. You've, you've worked with like so many ultra high achievers and seeing obviously how, how their team works logistically bringing out a former president of the United States. But what do you think sets aside like those ultra high achievers from everyday people? What do they do that you've observed that not everyone else does? I think the fact that they set boundaries, that and my wife often says, you know, set, you've got to set boundaries. Right? So they really, you know, they'll say no sometimes. Yeah. Right? Uh, they and their team around them understand them, so they're supporting them. And I often think with President Clinton that his team try and protect him because he's got so many things he still wants to do in his life yeah. and he's only got so many hours, so many days, so many years. So they make sure that the mess doesn't get there to, so he can get his job done. Mm. And sometimes I often say my three words for advice to people who want to be successful is persistence, enthusiasm, and focus. And if all else fails, just remember persistence. Yeah. So if you want to be successful, persist. You've got to yeah. keep going. Don't let the, anything get in the way of that persistence. You've got to keep that drive. And Arnold Schwarzenegger's five tips for, for success are – and, he, and I think he's one of the most successful people ever because he became a, a world champion in sports, in bodybuilding. He became a leading man in the movies. He got to the top in the movie profession. Uh, before that, he'd actually started in property. So he was a multimillionaire from yeah. property before he even started it all. And then he got to the top in property. Highest he could do, and he couldn't become president. He became governor of California. Yeah. And so business, everything. Everything he's done, he's gone to the top. He's a certain. His five tips for success are, and if you're at home or you're listening to this anywhere, you can always rewind and write it down, but... Five Tips for Success by Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'll be back. <laughs> First one, and this is him as a kid at 15, have a vision. And for him, he wanted to be a bodybuilder and he wanted to get into the movies. Tip two, think big. He didn't just want to be any bodybuilder, want to be a world champion bodybuilder. Think big. Didn't just want to be in the movies, want to be a leading man in movies. Three, don't listen to the naysayers. You're thinking through your life every time you come up with ideas. Well, oh, you'll not be able to do that. Even you would have. I'm sure that your mates and family would have said, "Oh, you're not. What are you doing? This happy skin stuff? Yeah. Or you're crazy?" You know, like they tell you you can't do stuff. So don't listen to the naysayers. And when Arnold got to Hollywood, they said to him, well, "You're not going to make it in movies." But first, first of all, look at the shape of your body, right? Uh, yeah, you might become a soldier. <laughs> you can be a bodyguard. You're not going to be a leading man in movies, right? And and the other, listen to your accent. There's never been a man with an Austrian accent who's been a leading man in movies. That ain't going to happen. 
What's your name? Schwarzer Schnitzel? That's not going to look any good on the posters. So Arnold used all those negatives to be positives. Yeah. His first major movie, Conan the Barbarian, uh, Dino De Laurentiis, who made it, said, we couldn't have made this movie without having this guy with this amazing body. And the accent, everybody knows the accent. Everybody does the impersonations. Get to the chopper. Like, everybody knows his accent. Schwarzenegger, obviously, if you know. So That's iconic. He, he, so you'd use the negatives to become positives. And then this fourth tip, work your ass off. Mm. And, and he still to this day works really hard. Yeah. And fifth tip, give back. He chucked his movie career in to go and become governor of California. Mm. Didn't take the wage, just wanted to give yeah. back to the people. Him and I think the closest person to him since, I'd have to say, would be The Rock. Look what he's doing now. The Rock's pretty good. Pretty pretty up there, following a similar thing. And he, and he speaks about similar sort of values. Um, with like setting massive goals and then just backing yourself and working your ass off. Um, I want to ask you as well, before we move into some, some, some questions just about favorite memories and things like that, but talk to me about the, just because of she's the, one of the biggest celebrities on the planet now, talk to me about your experience working with Kim Kardashian and how actually professional and impressive she was to deal with. She's the most professional person I've ever dealt with, literally. The most professional person. So she was the function we did he functioned in two days in New York, Toronto, and Chicago. Then there's another one in New York a few weeks later, a few months later. And she's there half an hour before. And when it's time for her to do the stuff, she does it all, does everything you want her to do. And just to get, she's just a really together woman. Yeah. And so, and, and the first function we did was in New York. And what we were doing, I was working with Michael Hill, the jewelers, and we were giving away this 22 carat diamond ring. And when the ad agency pulled me in and said, you know, how do you, want to, how do you think you should promote this? Or what are your, what are your ideas? And I said, we need a celebrity to, to launch it. And I suggested Kim Kardashian. And the ad agency knew who it was, but I don't think that Michael Hill's jewelers <laughs> had any idea. This is 2010. This is actually, it was actually just when Instagram first started. They haven't even got their billion dollar sale to Mark Zuckerberg at the time. This is October 2010. And uh, so, and I signed Kim and did the deal. And we we're just going to launch it in New York at the Rock of Fellow Center, because Rock, Diamond. And, uh, and when, when they realized that she was a big star, they said, Can we take her to Toronto and Chicago? I said, Sure. Because they had North American business. And they're still the biggest jewelers in Canada, really? Michael Hiller. Yeah. I mean, they're big in Australia and New Zealand, but they're a public company in both countries, but they're also the oh. biggest jewelry store in, uh, across Canada. So we did this function. And uh, and she, I mean, she has a pretty big entourage, but nowhere near the size of Clinton. But she's got meet and greet at the airport. So that's not having your car waiting for you. They actually meet you off the plane and escort you <laughs> to the car, right? And they organize your cases and all that. So, And when you get to an airport, they meet you there from the car and take you to the plane. Um, so we had meet and greet. We flew in her hair and makeup people that had... A stylist has to pull the clothes for the for her. We had a PR person with her, agent flew in for it. Uh, we obviously booked all the hotels. Um, but here's some gossip. People won't like a bit of gossip. Yeah, she, she didn't stay in a hotel the night before. She stayed. Who did she marry the first time? Chris, somebody basketball Basket. player. She, Thompson is that his name? Chris, An was it Chris Hanstey or something? Know, Joe. Look it up for us so we can Look get it, up, it right. Yeah. We got we got forty minutes to go. It's in the book somewhere. As <laughs> yeah. I was reading. Anyway, so day. so. This is the guy she finished up marrying. Is it so, Clay Thompson? Oh, I can't remember his name. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, not anyway, keeping up with the Kardashian. Famous Bella. basketballer. Anybody yeah, who knows yeah, Kim yeah. Kardashian will tell you immediately, why don't you know that? Yeah, yeah, anyway, yeah. So she, she stayed with him the night before in New Jersey, then comes over at like six in the morning, does hair, makeup, she gets all ready, does the, does the thing. And this is something else people might not know. Um, after we'd done you know, a presentation and stuff, then we had to, she has to do something which I'd never heard of before. It's called step and repeat. And is this on video? Can, they on see? Video, can yeah, I stand yeah. up? Is this going to ruin? Can stand it? up. Okay. So step and Good repeat is this. So let's say, um, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So let's say you're Kim Kardashian, and there's a phalanx of photographers there. So you step, and you so I've got the diamond ring. So you I'm doing my impersonation to Kim Kardashian now. So you step, and you step, and repeat, step. <laughs> <laughs> so that everybody gets the one on shot, the face the on shot. shot. You've got 40 photographers there. It might take you 
three minutes, but everybody wants their everybody wants their yeah. full on shot with I'm sitting down now. Uh, everybody wants their full on shot with Kim Kardashian. So I learned how to step and repeat. Um, but that's how she gets so much value for everything she does, right? She understands the ins and outs, the way to maximize every opportunity, and that's why she's been able to kill it, and why brands keep wanting to work with her because it overperforms when they do. She's professional. Mm. And the other thing which she does afterwards, we did some one on ones. You often do. At a media conference, you do one on one, so one on one interviews. You know, oh, can I get a. She did, we had 30 of them lined up. She did every single one of them. Yeah. She, you know, she stood and they came, chat, 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 chat. Next, chat, 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 chat. And uh, so then that was in, in the morning. And then I get to the airport that night. She's there already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course. We did the function that night. We're setting up still. And the. The PR people in the car said, we're, 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 we're coming around now. I said, no, keep going around the block. We're not ready yet. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. you know, I've got media here. We're setting up and all. And then uh, the next day we're leaving Toronto to go to Chicago. Again, she's at the private airport. I had to, have to have a private airplane. Yeah, yeah. As you do. Uh, and she's at the uh, private uh, air, air, the lounge before you get on the plane. Um, they're ready. Chicago that night um, so I, we did it in a shopping centre somewhere where's the Michael Hill jewelry and I'd never been to Chicago before so I'm so excited because I've got like 200 people there so Kim Kardashian will be here shortly because I'm doing the thing and I explained when I was a kid my dad had this aqua show right and one of the songs was a song about Chicago so I thought I'd sing it for you Chicago, Chicago, that title in town. Chicago, Chicago, I'll show you around. You'll love it. Bet your bottom dollar you lose your blues in Chicago. Chicago, the town that Billy Sunday could not shut down. On State Street, that great street, I'll show you the way. They do things they don't do on Broadway. Hey, you'll have the time, the time of your life. You know, I once saw a man who actually danced with his wife in Chicago. Chicago's my hometown. So they, <laughs> a lot of people in Chicago still don't know that song. Like they know, they've heard the first few words of it. And funnily enough, Valerie Jarrett, President Obama, yeah, yeah. was here. When, and she came with her mum. And so we're in the dressing room uh, before she had to go on stage and speak. And I said, I've got a song for you. So I sang that. And they were so excited to <laughs> hear their home song about Chicago. And again, people don't know the words to it. But anyway, so I sang that. Then Kim came out because I did the MC and yeah. stuff. So. Well, that's yeah. the thing about Kim, right? It's it's such a common misconception. And people say, "Oh, she doesn't. They don't deserve their money. They just show up and make." But they oh. fucking work hard, and they've drilled it down to a science, right? They are not just floating around making money. Like, yeah, they can make money easily because of the massive brand they've built. But to do what they do at that level, I guarantee you, you couldn't do it. To those people, random people calling them out, there's not a chance you could do that. And now the gossip, I was coming close, getting close. Yeah, don't tell anybody this. I will turn the mics down story. for this one. So after the gig in Chicago, she went out somewhere. And I didn't find out till the next day because it finished up. Maybe it was in the paper, maybe it wasn't. But she went out with some guy. Remember, she'd been with Chris the night before and that marriage only lasted 80 days later that year. Anyway, she went out with some guy called Kanye West. <laughs> Kanye West, is it? Is it Kanye West? Oh. She went out with Kanye West in Chicago that night. Wow. Who was to be her... Second husband. So all of that started potentially from... from it's all my fault. It's, it's all, all my... You. Blame me. <laughs> it's all you. The downfall of Kanye is uh, due to Max Markson, if yeah. everyone wants to get their jabs in. Um, I wanted to ask you something as well, because, look, you've had a lot of fun life. You know, it's fun bringing all these people. I still am. You still I are. Still <laughs> That's the thing. But my, my, my question is, apart from all the fun you get to have bringing people out, as you said, you have all these meetings today, you're putting on events in the next week, later this week. But behind all that, like you've also done a lot of good, like the amount of money you've raised for, for charity and different galas and stuff. You might not know this and it might, you might not even be able to fathom what it is, but how much money, if you had to approximate you've raised for charity over the last 20, 30 years, what do you think you've, you've, you've raised for charity in total for these events? Well, I, I know because thank God someone, there's a Z drive in the office and they put all the functions in. Oh, so yeah. I know all the stuff on it. And from when Singo, I had that tea with Singo. I've done over 200 events, given yeah. over $40 million to charity. Wow. And that's up till, I don't know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago or whatever. So, so I've, I've, I don't do as many events as I used to do, but yeah. I'm still, but even at the moment, this is important, guys. Um, there's 
and working with legacy. Yep. And legacy, for those who don't know it, started on the battlefields of France in World War One, when one digger said to his dying mate, I'll look after the missus and the kids. And to this day, legacy still looks after over 40,000 widows and their kids. And um, the first legacy club started in Melbourne in 1923. So next year, 2023, is the 100th anniversary of legacy. So there's going to be a torch relay, which will start on the battlefields of France, go to London, come to be flown to Perth, then it'll go down to Albany where the diggers first left from, back to Perth, across to Adelaide, up to Darwin, all the way down the east coast of Australia. And it's 55,000 kilometres. And if you're connected with legacy or the defence forces in any way, shape or form, we're looking for volunteers to carry the torch. We need 1,500 torch bearers, and this is active now. Go to legacytorchrelay.com.au or download the Legacy Torch Relay app, but legacytorchrelay.com.au, and I'll say this again in a minute uh, if anyone wants to write it down. So we're looking for volunteers who are connected with the Defence Forces, maybe parents or grandparents or someone in your family might have fought or served. Um, and then separate to that, we're also looking for a couple of thousand volunteers to help on the relay and it'll be going all round. And we need to raise $10 million. We're about 5.2 million so far. And uh, we've got some fantastic support. Defence Health have put money in to help sponsor the relay. Lockheed Martin Australia uh, doing community days around the country and uh, BAE are helping. There's some enormous uh, love out there for, for legacy because you know people have put their lives on the line for our country. and. Uh, and sometimes they don't come back, and the widows and the kids have to be looked after, and Legacy do a magnificent job doing that. Mm. LegacyTorchRelay.com.au, Legacy if you want to get involved. I remember in um, in high school, we um, did, like, some Legacy fundraising. We went around to, like, all different um, car yards and whatever business, local yep. businesses there were. And I remember I was the first person to sell out my box of uh, little badges and well stuff. Done. And then because I sold them out, I got a second box. I sold that. And they're like, do you have anything else? They had like $200 badges and I was selling them. And that's the first time that thinking back, I didn't realize at the time that I fell in love with business and I fell in love with sales and business development. And it was just like this incredibly fun game. Like yeah. you're a kid, it's a game selling all this stuff. But then that was the first, I remember, I always remember that moment raising funds for, for Legacy Day. And, and Legacy Foundation, and it was the first like little mini experience I had in business. So I'll always remember that. Well, and every every year, I mean, Legacy Week's first Friday in September, which comes up. Yeah. Uh, you know, so if you want to give a, a great charity, Legacy yeah. is a great charity. Um, I want to ask you something, Max, as well. It's it's a quote from your book. I, I'll just find it here and I'll read it to you. Um, where are we? It was, you were talking about the Lion Nathan event that they tried to put on for Rudy Giuliani and one, yep. they had to cancel one of the events because they didn't sell enough tickets, which is why they should have done it with you. But anyway, um, and you find out like years later that all they did that night was like watch TV in their hotel room. And your response to that was, I couldn't believe it. That's so wrong. Even if it's not for work, you take the talent out and make them feel good. Yeah. Well, obviously I can identify that you've built a whole career of making people feel good. Right, that's so important, that, especially the repeat business. But then all the how important referrals are to you. If you didn't do so well with Clinton, then they would like. I'm sure you want to work with Bush. But in your words, why is that so important? It becomes your reputation, mm. and especially if someone's coming in from overseas. Yeah, like hospitality. You have yeah. to look after them. Yeah, and. Often the agents overseas don't want to send their talent to Australia because they're worried about <laughs> 12,000 mile away. So What's going to happen? Like, you know, is it a proper country? The kangaroos running down the street <laughs> or whatever? And, and, and there's a duty of care. Mm. And it's the same if you're taking a girl out, you take her home at the end of the night, you know? You seem, you're very humble with all these responses that it's, oh, it's just what you do. But you, this, these qualities and relationship building skills, whether that you call them skills or they're just innate within you, are why you've had, I believe, look out, being able to have such an impressive career and so much success. And it's not just as easy as that because so many people put on events and they fucking shit, you know what I mean? So in my opinion, that's a massive part of your success. Um, I'm getting conscious of time. I want to do like a quick, not a quick fire, but a quick fire. My last questions, you've done so much. I had Go to fit it. it all into an hour and just 
quick, quick answers and to get your response. Uh, first one, we'll start really easy. Of all the tours you've put on, what one do you think you've had the most fun on? Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> I was really impressed with MC Hammer. MC right? Hammer, right? nice. Yeah, so yeah. MC Hammer, when I picked him up at the it was for Microsoft and uh, they were launching a new karaoke thing with their um, – Xbox. Yeah, yeah. And and they obviously put his song on there. Can't touch this. Right? <laughs> and and so they brought him in for that, but also he's absolutely I picked him up at the airport and from the way we came into Melbourne and on the from Melbourne to, from the airport to the hotel, it was like talking to someone from five years in the future. Because he's so mm. tech savvy. He's you know Lives in San Francisco, so knows all the tech guys there. And he's explaining to me then, this is like 12, 14 years ago. He's explaining to me then, say, in the future, <laughs> right, with your phone, you know, you'll be able to, you know, if I like your tie and I want to buy it from you, you know, you'll, uh, and you say it's 100 bucks, you'll be able to swipe your phone and get the money, which you can do, you know, on all those Quite apps. literally, that, yeah, yeah. Literally yeah. can. And he said, and you'll be walking down the street and it'll tell you which way to go if you want to get somewhere. This is, you know, like your own GPS or whatever. Yeah. And he said, and on this phone, with this phone, I can just go in and do a concert with 50,000 people. <laughs> I just put this in, plug the phone in, and that's my backing mm. tracks and stuff like that. So it blew my mind. So, And then we spent a week on the road, and we just had fun with, you know, he's teaching me his too cool, too cool. Too, too, <laughs> what's the, there's another song which is really oh, – a... See, let's show my age. MC Hammer was like right yeah, as I but... was like coming into my teens, I feel was big. Too soon, something to quit. Too, too, mm. And he was telling me about he was doing it with a barber. Yeah. <laughs> and then – and I remember being in the back of a cab going to the airport in Auckland, and I'm showing my YouTube with a guy called Gene Pitney. Gene was famous 60 years ago, right? And he had songs, uh, his big hit was, Dearest, darling, I had to write to say that I won't be home anymore because I was only 24 hours from Tulsa, only one day away from... So I'm showing this guy who's got amazing voice. He had no idea who Gene Pitney was, just yeah, as you yeah, know. Yeah. Right? But he was a superstar. Right? And I remember once with Gene Pitney, he was over here, and I was working at WS at the time, yeah. and he was performing in Parramatta at the Leagues Club, and, and he, I got him out to do an interview, and I'd send a helicopter to pick him up, and, um, and because the helicopter was filming commercial, it was late, so he walked away. So I got him back the next day to make sure the helicopter waited for him. Anyway, he says to me... Uh, We'd chat and, and he says he's going to go and be performing in England. I said, oh, my mum lives there. I said, oh, where does she live? I'm in Bournemouth. I said, oh, give me her number. I'll invite her to my show. So I gave one. Yeah. And like about three months later, my mum, I'm talking to my mum, said, oh, some friend of yours, a nice guy, rang up called Gene Pitney to ask me to come to his show. I said, I was too busy. I couldn't yeah. go. Like, oh, but, God. but he was a really cool guy, yeah. a lovely guy. Ah, oh, damn, that's so funny. Um, all right, on the let's talk about on the flip side, and this is where another time you got to spill the dirt, Max. We want we want realness here. Who would be the hardest celebrity you've had to work with or deal with? I shouldn't say this, but Linda Evangelista yep. was definitely the worst. <laughs> right? She was a supermodel. Yeah. So she was in the days when Elle McPherson, Cindy Crawford, like she was a genuine supermodel. She was yeah. actually in the media recently because I think she had some botched up surgery, but she was a supermodel and. Uh, I'd done a deal for a guy to put, who's now the chairman of the ABC, Ita Buttrose, who's quite an oh, iconic wow. person. Yeah. Uh, I, I was managing Ita, and I did a deal for her to do a treadmill. So it was the Ita Buttrose treadmill, and we made a fortune from it. Anyway, so this guy says, can we do, get me a supermodel, as people do. And I said, sure, why? So well, I'm going to take, the, I want to put the person's name on that and do treadmills all over the world. Ita's obviously famous here in Australia, yeah. but I want someone who's famous in America. And else. So I ring up El McPherson, Cindy Crawford, well, not actually wearing them, but they're agents. Yeah, no, yeah. I finished up getting Linda Evangelista. So we bring Linda Evangelista in and uh, we're filming here with the agent and the photographer and the videographer. And she says, what should I wear? And I say, well, you know, I'd wear something to go on the treadmill and then change into something beautiful. And we did the launch at Catalina's, a beautiful restaurant in Sydney at Rose Bay. And all the media came. And the next day in the paper, my phone starts ringing at 6 o'clock, which always means there's something... Something's, Something's wrong. wrong. <laughs> and Linda Evangelista wants to give me a right mouthful, which she does. Can, because in the Sydney Morning Herald that day, it said that Linda Evangelista looked like she was dressed like she was going out to clean the loo on a Sunday morning. And Linda Evangelista is a supermodel and looks gorgeous, but she didn't look... She had a T-shirt and a pair of shorts on. Yeah. yeah it wasn't a schmick. Anyway, so she went berserk at me. Not that I wrote the story, but because I hadn't advised her what to wear. And 
there was no point in me trying to tell her I did. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, that night I'm at a dinner, a big variety club charity dinner, and I organise a table to bring Linda along to it. And I'm sitting here like we're sitting opposite, and she's there talking to the boss of the company, and I'm there. And all she does is bad mouth me all night to her in front of That's me. Rough. And for the rest of it, I never got to see Linda eventually. So yeah. the, the agents are best not to. So she was probably the most difficult. And now you've done a lot of deals, hundreds of deals, I imagine. Um, and what about uh, what I want to know about is some of the deals that you've been negotiating and didn't quite come through for whatever reason. Loads. Loads Who's, of them. If you had to pick one of those that didn't go through for whatever reason, who's one person that you were talking about working with but didn't and wish you could have? Al Pacino. Oh, Al Pacino. I, so when I was in New York for Kim Kardashian, yeah. we did Kim on the Saturday, so on the Monday, the 18th of October 2010. And on the Saturday, the 16th of October, I flew to Rochester, New York to meet Al Pacino. And he was doing a show there. And, and he was hitting the, he'd started doing the speaking circuit. And I flew up to meet Al and meet the agent. And I'd offered Al a million dollars to do four or five engagements. And I never got the to close yeah. the deal. Like, you know, we were going back and forth. He wanted more money. Mm-hmm. And uh, then he wanted $1.2 million. And I said, no, a million dollars. And anyway, never got to do it. And even a year later, there was another off came in. I still couldn't do it. And funnily enough, not that I really should say this, but there was talk of him coming this year, but the money was just crazy yeah. money again, you know. But I'd love to, I'd love to promote Al Pacino because I know I could make a lot of money for him and make a lot of money for me. See, I thought you were going to say Oprah because that was a massive oh. deal that almost happened as well. Yeah, Oprah was another one. It's amazing, like hearing that you're like, okay, she wanted this structure, didn't really work for me. You've had to say no and walk away from deals from like the fucking massive, massive amounts of potential money. But like, I guess it goes back to your point as like being disciplined in like what you say yes to and what you say no to. Yep. You know, yeah, you may be Oprah, but this is how I work. This is what's going to add value to me. And you can't just be like handing, like giving yourself up all the time, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I would have loved to Oprah. I still would. Yeah. I mean, there's so many people you'd love to promote. I mean, I'd love to promote Barack Obama. Again, mm-hmm. I've offered, I've offered. I've offered him five or six million dollars yeah. to come and do some events, but and and I, but you know there's still an opportunity out there for someone bought Kim Kardashian over. Mm. She'd pack out twenty thousand seat oh, stadiums easy. all over the country. Easy, yeah. You know? Who's one person if you could bring anyone to represent? Who would you pick? Um, there's so many. Look, I'd, I'd love to bring Trump. I'd love to bring Obama. Mm. Uh, I'd, I'd love to do a couple of presidents together on stage, like yeah. George George. W. Bush and President Clinton were doing gigs together at one really? stage in That's America. So that'd be cool. It's a bit like when Elton John and Billy Joel were doing shows yeah, together. Yeah. I think, you know, just, I just love celebrities. Yeah. I, I really do. I love stardom and, and, uh, and if I can make things work, then. What about, the way. what about your most, your favorite story from, from Mike Tyson? I still remember I was at your office a couple of years ago and I still have framed in the office yeah. a pair of signed Mike Tyson boxing shorts. What's your favorite story from, from Mike? Cause I know and you, everyone, was like afraid of like the the most like feared man on the planet, baddest man on the planet, whatever you want to call. But your experience with him was quite different, right? I had a one and uh, I got on really well with him, yeah. his wife Kiki, uh, and Milana Morocco, his two children he brought with, and his mother in law. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think last time I spoke to Kiki and been in contact with him last year, I was trying to get because I'd love to bring him back again. I mean, Mike's yeah. just an icon. Um, I think the funniest story is we've been on the week, we've done. Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, <laughs> Adelaide, Perth, and then and, and and then we came back to Sydney to fly out. But we're in Perth and we're in the in the lounge there and I'm entertaining the kids because I've always liked playing with kids and yeah. having fun. And and I'm teaching them how to be a penguin. Yeah. So I said and, and to be a penguin, you stand up and you, Arms are sort of dead. You walk <laughs> like that, you know, and with with your feet played out. So I'm saying, just follow me like this. We'll be yeah. penguins. And so then I turn around to check they're doing it. So Milan and Morocco are there, yeah. and behind them is baddest man on the planet, President you know, Mike Tyson, walking like a penguin. Walking you know, like so a penguin. It's fun, but you know, there's there's so many. You know, you talk about people like Ronaldo. I had a deal for Ronaldo oh, at one really? stage, and this is only about four years ago, wow. and he'd agreed. We were, I think. I'm trying to think if it was like I was going to do two gigs with him and I was going to pay him. I think it was either one and a half million or two million dollars. And then something happened on the one weekend, mm. 
and it went up by a million dollars. And I just couldn't make it work. And I was going to do like 50,000 people in the stadiums yeah, and have yeah, them do yeah. like exhibition of, you know, bring kids out to be able to teach them how to mm. head, how to do goals. And then we'd have them driving around in the golf buggy, sh sh mm. shaking hands for a quarter of an hour. Anyway, there's, there's loads of people out there and there's always people. Yeah. All right, second last question. We'll wrap this up, get you on your way. Um, question I want to ask is like, like, again, we're talking a lot about the massive celebrities, but you said you do a lot of things. Like PR isn't just event organization. Um, one of the things you, you you probably are the the best at doing right now is when people comes off something like a reality TV yep. show or whatever event happens and they have their 15 minutes of fame, you always say, and I, and I love the line, if you can make that 15 minutes of fame, 17 minutes of fame, you've done your job. Why do you think some people that have their shot at making it a career make it and others don't? What what are the what are the ones that are successful to, to extend their 15 minutes of fame do that the others don't? What is it? I think work ethic is one. Yeah. They've got an uh, engagement with their audience. So if, they, yeah. if they've suddenly got 100 or 200,000 followers on Instagram, <laughs> you yeah. know, build it, work it, work it, work it, baby. And uh, be professional. So yeah. fulfill the Instagram if you get some collabs. And then the other thing, which is really important, is to get another TV show. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I was... I've been looking after Jessica Power since 2019 and still do. She's been going from show to show to And show we've had her on a few shows, yeah, yeah which yeah. is great. And of, that's Of course. And that's what it's about. Mm. And there's uh, a show called The Challenge coming up, which I've got a few people on there. Yeah, nice. And Survivors, you know, I've got some people on there. So I think I, I, I've got all these influences I represent. Mm. And I just try and get them on shows and get them to do more work. Yeah. And that's, that's the clue. Because at yeah. the end of the day... They come to me because they want to earn money, so I'm and get jobs. So I'm like a, a overgrown HR person, <laughs> you know, like and try and that that's yeah. I just try and help them. But some of them you can't like with Instagram influencers. The guys don't get many deals. It's all nah, about the girls. It's not as many, eh? So the the guys just aren't the ones. I'll tell you the guys that can, and this is like the uh, someone who we had a bit of success with working you about yeah. ages uh, a few years ago was Grant Cap of 2018. That is, that's, yeah, yeah, because like the, you tell you the guys that work well, the guys that have like female audiences because yeah. it's all the females that brands really want to get. Yeah. They don't care if the well the smart ones don't care if the influencer is female. They care about who the audience is. So yeah. that's a tip for anyone doing any influence marketing. Um, but last question, I thought I'd leave on a story. I, I thought it was such a funny little story. You ended the uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, chapter on. I wouldn't tell me you've worked with Arnie, Arnie many times, brought him over. And there was this time you hadn't seen him for a couple of years and you got invited to uh, the premiere yeah. of um, Terminator Genesis and you get there. And tell me the story about you had an empty seat next to you. So it was when the movie was, whatever, Terminator Genesis was coming out. Yeah. And, uh, and so his office was running, do you want to come? You know, we're coming back to do a, yeah. <laughs> do the publicity of the movie. So I said, sure. So we go there and I'm with my wife and uh, with a sat us in this, like a reserved row. Yeah. We're sitting there and there's a seat next to me. So we're watching and Arnold's up on stage being interviewed yeah. and that. So then the lights go down and the movie starts to come up. And next thing, there's Arnold Schwarzenegger sitting next to me <laughs> yeah. watching Terminator. So it was pretty cool. Oh, and, what, yeah. And, and uh, then I, I looked after Arnold. Well, I brought him here in 2013, so I did work with him then. Then when the Arnold Sports Festival started, I looked after him every year, 2015, 2016, 17, 18, 19. Anyway, and this, in 2000, pretty soon it's 2018, he's come... Uh, we've done publicity at the airport in Melbourne with him. I've had him do another load of media in the afternoon, like an hour of one-on-one -on -one interviews. <laughs> on the Saturday morning, uh, Dylan Orcott's uh, yeah, has is, is come down. So I've had him play wheelchair uh, tennis, tennis or basketball <laughs> with him there, and he's never done that before in a wheelchair. <laughs> then we've done something more that night with all the competition. Then the next day, we've had him start a fun run. So he's there again. I've had him do media there. And then he's, he's told me, he'd said when he first arrived, I want to come bring had Heather, his partner with him, uh, show her Sydney. She's not been to Sydney. So uh, we're going to fly to Sydney. Can you organise the boat? Because I've taken him, him and his son Patrick out on the boat before. And uh, mate of mine, Joe Elias, has got all occasion cruises. And they've got this fantastic boat, the Seven Star, which is like 100 foot long. That's yeah. a schmick boat. So uh, we organised to go on that. And uh, we're out in the harbour. And there's only four of us. There's Arnold, there's Heather, there's Daniel Ketchell, his right-hand man, and there's me. And we're sitting at the back of the boat and uh, and he looks over at me and he says, Max, you are my pimp and I am your whore. <laughs> and I said to him, how do I stand up against all the pimps you've had over the last 50 years? <sighs> said, oh, Max, you're up there. You're up there. <laughs>
Well, on that note, one of the best pimps going around, Max Markson. Thank you so much. As I said, I consider you a friend and a mentor. Um, you're a legend. I can't wait to see what you keep doing with all these events and people you're bringing out. For anyone who wants to find more info on yourself or any of the projects you're working on, where's the best place for people to find you? Just give me a call, 0412-501-601. Or go to my Instagram, my phone number's on there. Exactly. You won't If you want to find him, you won't struggle, that's for sure. Again, thank you. I'll let you get out, get out of here. I know you've got a busy day ahead and I've taken up too much of your time, but thanks again. Appreciate it. My pleasure, you. my pleasure. Thank you, thanks, for having me. Appreciate it. All right, there we go. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, could you please do me a quick favor and hit the follow or subscribe button? I honestly appreciate it more than you know. Thanks again and I'll see you next time.